and it's a weird world, after all, with Catherine Williams. Welcome back to The Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now this week, we're talking about how it's a weird world, after all. Later on the show, we're going to talk with Catherine Williams about Weird But True. World 2024, new from National Geographic Kids. Now, Earth is a pretty bizarre place if you think about it. I mean, early on, our planet got whacked wicked hot by a body the size of Mars. Now that the debris left from this blow entered orbit around Earth, warming the moon. Uh, now, beneath the crunchy surface of Earth and under the nougat-like center of our planet's mantle lies a soft, chewy outer core surrounding a solid, crunchy center, with each core made up mostly of iron along with a dash or two of nickel. Now, vast quantities of heat are being generated here, making the core of the Earth roughly as hot as the surface of the Sun. I know, right? So, part of this heat is left over from the formation of the planet, and some comes from friction. Perhaps half this heat is the result of the radioactive decay of heavy elements. Our planet is basically a working nuclear fission reactor, putting out about 20 terawatts of heat, more than all the energy usage by the entire human race. Now, Earth has the only known oceans of water found on the surface of a planet, and beneath the seafloor we find roughly 300,000 trillion trillion microorganisms. That is a party! Mosses! They're found all over the world, and they can absorb water directly from the atmosphere using structures called ons. Fungi? Don't get me started on fungus, all right? Now there are your normal yeast, your mold, your mildews, and your mushrooms. The largest organism in the world is in fact a honey fungus living in the Blue Mountains of Oregon. Appropriately named the humongous fungus. It is thought to be among us for at least 2,400 years and it can even be pushing its 8,650th birthday. Now, fungi communicate amongst themselves and other species through chemical and electrical signals sent through underground networks of mycelia. Incredibly, these life forms can interpret these signals that they receive in the context of other chemicals, the way that words can change meaning based on the rest of a sentence. Using old-fashioned human communication, next up we're going to talk with Catherine Williams about Weird But True, World 2024, new from National Geographic Kids. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to welcome Catherine Williams back to the show. She is an editor at Nat Geo Kids, and we're going to be talking about Weird But True, World 2024, uh, new from uh, new from Nat Geo Kids. Welcome back to the show, Catherine. Thanks. It's nice to be back. Good to see you again. Yeah, you you as well. All right. So I have to say, I spent uh, pretty much good part of last night and all of this morning just looking up weird facts in this book. <laughs> <laughs> what's your weirdest? What's what's your favorite weirdest fact? Oh, my favorite. 
It's always so tough. It's like choosing a, a child in a very low six situation here, but uh, <laughs> choosing a weirdest track. But uh, one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite sections in the book is on our like weird sports in the Europe yeah. chapter, um, just because the photos are so funny. I think middle school kids will really love it. Um, so we have extreme ironing from the United Kingdom. Um, yeah, that kind of ironing. <laughs> um, so we have this photo of someone in a scuba suit underwater with an ironing board set up, um, ironing clothes. I mean, I don't think they're actually getting ironed to be fair, but <laughs> the, the act of, of, of ironing is what's important for this competition. And so people try to do it in the weirdest places possible. Um, so some people do it bungee jumping, some people do it on mountains, some people do it while water skiing. And so the idea is just whoever does it in the weirdest place is you know, the winner. So we have a, a cool picture of uh, someone scuba diving and doing that. And then on the same uh, page, we have uh, pumpkin paddling in Germany. So there's a pumpkin festival and people hollow out these giant pumpkins and they paddle them like canoes and they race them. Uh, so I think like those are some very, very fun, uh, cool photos and, and sports. I definitely would love to um, jump inside of a giant pumpkin. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would, <laughs> I would definitely do that. A court time was had by all. <laughs> okay, I, I, I just, I just have to think though. Underwater ironing it kind of like renders the whole steam button moot, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think uh, <laughs> you're, you're going for, you're not going for quality of ironing here. <laughs> All right. You love weird stuff. I love weird stuff. Why does everybody love weird stuff? Oh, man. And this is like the time old question. I feel like you could study psychology. You could just like spend your whole PhD trying to figure this out. Um, for me, I feel like weird stuff is... I don't know. We get, we get caught in our routines and weird stuff sometimes can pull you out of it. I also mm -hmm. think weird stuff like just shows you things... It changes your view of the world. We kind of have to be closed-minded sometimes and live in our own like realities. And then sometimes something really weird happens and you're like, wow, I didn't know that was possible. And it expands your expands your experience of the world. Um, maybe that's very lofty, but for you know, extreme ironing. But um, you know, there's all kinds of weird animals in this book. There's weird places. There's a giant sinkhole. Um that was recently found in China that has a forest that humans haven't been to yet at the bottom of it. So there's like little things to learn and, and see and explore, even if we feel like we've done it all and seen it all. Um, uh, and I think weird stuff can, can open your mind in that way. Yeah, absolutely. And so speaking of open minds, uh, dog surfing? <laughs> <laughs> yes so we have um, a kind of a fun twist on a, a beloved subject of ours so we often feature a lot of different careers for kids in our books and so a lot of them are like paleontology um, biology things like that. Um, and in this book, we wanted to focus on some really weird careers that are maybe not so practical, but someone's doing them. And so we have a dog surfer uh, or dog surf instructor is featured. Um, so if you have the very specific skills of knowing how to train dogs very well and knowing how to surf, you might be able to train dogs to surf. Um, and then the dogs could compete in surfing competitions, which apparently does happen. Uh, and other animals have learned to surf as well, including, I think we have pigs and goats listed in, in the book, but also cats, which I think is very surprising to get a cat on a surfboard. It seems like quite the challenge. I don't know. To me, to me, I think I, I think I would have a tougher time convincing a goat to keep standing up for spindling <laughs> little legs, center of gravity, you know, meter above. You know, the maybe board. so. <laughs> I've never convinced a goat to get on a surfboard, so I'll have to report back to you. <laughs> <laughs> ah okay let's say you're not lucky enough to be a dog or a goat but you still feel like going surfing volcano boarding <laughs> yes you can do that um and I'm not sure if I uh am here to encourage children to do that but when they <laughs> grow up and, <laughs> and have safety gear yes um there is a volcano in uh, Nicaragua uh, Cerro Negro, where people can rent, um, they're kind of like sleds, boards to uh, zoom down the side of a volcano. And I have had someone ask me, um, 
is the volcano erupting? Is there, are they surfing on lava? No, they're surfing on volcanic ash. It's not <laughs> an active volcano situation. Um, but it is still pretty extreme um, and they can zip down pretty fast. Um, and we have a cool photo of that in the book as well. Yeah, it's 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 really too bad they're not, you know, like surfing on lava because that would bring <laughs> to like a whole new level, you know. That would be pretty extreme. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just I'm just picturing like, you know, somebody, you know, in the first century CE just, you know, like surfing down, <laughs> uh surfing down Pompeii you know, yeah. <laughs> as, as yeah. it erupts, you know. Hanging you... 10 or hanging <laughs> X, as the case may be. <laughs> yeah, you only have a few seconds before your board melts or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, and what with that image in mind, <laughs> what first interested you in science? Oh, I, you know, I was like one of those kids that um, was always kind of in the dirt and playing with insects and things like that. <laughs> So I think it was a very hands-on um, introduction to science and, um, and and nature. So I just loved playing with plants and bugs and uh, and and things like that, and learning more about those as a kid and a teenager. Um, and now I am pretty fortunate to get to think about those same things all day. I was a big animal nerd and now I still look at pictures of animals and I <laughs> think like in some ways I uh, have kept my inner child alive doing kind of this uh, as a career. Do you have animals at home now? Not now, not now. I live in a city apartment but but I grew up with a uh, a dog but also a rabbit and turtles and um butterflies always migrating through the yard so oh that's not that's, not now though yeah that's wonderful and uh actually next week on the show uh we're talking with neil degrasse tyson for our 200th anniversary and i'm not 200th episode and one of the things we talked about was how can we get more critical thinking in the world and how do books uh like the weird but true series help attract reluctant readers and get kids into science. Yeah, that is, I, I'm going to have to tune in for your Neil deGrasse Tyson interview. That sounds awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the goal is to get, I mean, that's what we've heard from parents specifically. Um, we get that feedback is that our books um, attract a certain reader who doesn't gravitate towards reading naturally, maybe, or it's a bit of a chore. Um First thing is nonfiction is appealing to a lot of kids who aren't aren't reading novels and things like that because it has more, they feel like it relates more to the real world that they're interacting with. But also um, we have these big photos and these fun facts that are kind of called out and then you can read more about them on the same page so that you flip open to something, you see a photo that you're interested in, and then you want to read more that pulls in that reluctant reader. So we have gotten feedback from parents that their kids who they cannot get to read anything um, will actually carry our books around and, and um, won't stop reading them, which is super rewarding. Um, and, and I love hearing that kind of thing. So I think um, that this book and books like it definitely fill that role. Mm, yeah, I mean, when I was like looking through the book earlier, I was, uh, I just, that picture of the woman canoeing, uh, pumpkining. Mm -hmm. in yeah, the, the pumpkin court, paddling. It's just like, oh, I have to read this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then it gets you hooked and you might start reading more and, um, and, and maybe you might want to do some research on your own. I think that like there's something a kid's going to be interested in, whether you're a dinosaur nerd or animal nerd or you're into archaeology or history or something. Um, and this book has a pretty big selection of all kinds of things. There's going to be at least one thing that hooks a kid and then um, and then gets them gets them sucked in. Hmm. And uh, or or more than one thing. Hopefully many, <laughs> many things. Many, so many things. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, just uh, looking, I was on, uh, you know, that blue blue and white social media uh, thing a couple of days ago, and somebody was talking about how much, how much they dislike their work. And 
a few people, most people were chiming in that they disliked their work as well, but the but there were a few that talked about how much they loved going into work. And those people all had, were doing something related to science. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, yeah no, no dog surf instructors. I, I, unfortunately, I'm sure they're coming. just too happy. To, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, no, it's awesome. Yeah. So I, I'm just wondering, what do, what do you love most about your work? Oh, I, I mean, I love, um, I, so when I originally, so I got a degree in writing and I, um, partly just could not figure out what to do with myself. And I thought, okay, um, if I, I can become a good writer, I can, I can learn about all kinds of things and write about them. And that's kind of what I do actually. And so I love love learning, um, learning new things every day and, um, I don't feel like I get stuck in a rut. You know, I, I'm always trying to find new things, learning things, um, seeing the world. I also love working with our um, National Geographic has some really um, cool down to earth, talented people that work there. And so I work with awesome designers and photographers and researchers every day. Um, and I really admire what they do. So those those are the two things I think I like most about my job. Hmm. I think there's like so many of these greater pursuits, um, not only, you know, certainly all the sciences, but also filmmaking, um, writing, you know, where where I think it can become not only an occupation, but a vocation, something you just do because you love doing it and you love learning. And there's so much information that you take in every day. It's like the world's greatest school and the world's greatest playtime at the same time. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. I think like um, maybe adults don't don't play as much as they could, and and there's a reason for that. But there's ways to kind of inject it into into work it if you're in the right space and the right headspace. Um, and I, I hope that uh, I do that because I think making fun books, I have to be having some amount of fun as well yeah. for it to come through. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so where do you find your fact to me? I assume you're not just calling up the local reference librarian and <laughs> saying yeah. what's the weirdest building in Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, you know, <laughs> um, no, so I work with a, a team of uh, multiple writers and editors and um, researchers who work with me on this project and then they bring everything to me and I get the luxury of just saying yes, no, yes, no for things. But um, uh, a lot of it is that we are constantly keeping tabs on all the weird wor- news happening in the world, the weird things, um, pretty much all the time. So even when I'm not currently working on this book, I like people sending emails, with, like ideas. Um, but also, um, sometimes the writers do call up people if we want, you know, to have a, a, a part of the world that we feel like we haven't been able to feature mm-hmm. as much. They might call up somebody who they know who lives around there and ask them things. Um, they've interviewed researchers who lived in, in Antarctica. Um, and so some of it is, is, is inspired by firsthand accounts. A lot of it is just a whole lot of research coming from a lot of different places and also a lot of just like experience. We get a lot of um, facts coming our way at National Geographic all the time. Hmm. Okay. All right. So obviously the, you know, you've been doing this series for a while. Uh, there's no end to weird stuff out there. I mean, let's face facts. <laughs> I right? hope not. I'll be in <laughs> trouble if there is. <laughs> So, so what's next for you and what's next with the series and Nat Geo Kids and what's your future looking like, Catherine? <laughs> well, a lot more weird facts. So we actually, I'm already working on the third book, but I, it, it's under wraps. You'll have to talk to me next year to find out what's in that one. Um, but so more, more Weird But True World. We're doing that every year as far as we can see into the future. Um, but also I'm always working on um, other kids books at the same time. Um, I have another book that I worked on personally coming out um, next month. That's all about dinosaurs. Um, and I didn't know a thing about dinosaurs. It was not my strong suit. And then I edited this book and I became kind of a dinosaur nerd. So <laughs> I was like, 
<laughs> I'm like, I get it. Um, all, a lot of our middle school readers are absolutely obsessed with dinosaurs. Um, and I was fully converted while working on that book. So that's called Jurassic Smarts. We have a nice note in the front about how it's not just about the Jurassic time period. <laughs> <laughs> um and uh yeah we always have other weird but true books coming out we have um our almanac which is very popular Nat Geo Kids is still coming out with all kinds of books so um but people can check out this one as well as just all of all of the stuff we work on we we make books from um like dinosaur books atlases all the way to books about sports and activity books and stuff like that wow well, thanks so much for being on the show again, Catherine. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, it was lovely seeing you again. Um, yeah. Thanks so much. And that was Catherine Williams, editor at Nat Geo Kids. Check out their new book, Weird But True, World 2024. You're going to love it. So... What else is weird? The fact that tardigrades, like Terrence the terrifically tremendous tardigrade, here can live for decades without food, they can survive enormous blasts of radiation, can't ya? And they've been known to live for long periods in the vacuum of space. That is weird. How do you do that all anyway? Huh, really? Huh. No, oh, no, no, I get it, I get it. It's, it's, that's good advice, for sure. Anyway, I'm going to put you uh, back here on your chair and you take a little nap. All right. You know what else is weird? The fact that Superman could put on a pair of glasses and pass himself off as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter. I mean, really? So, basically... Clark Kent, Superman. Clark Kent, Superman. Clark Kent, Superman. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> and what is really weird is I've been doing this for almost 200 episodes now, including shorts. And I'm not rich and famous yet. I wonder what that would be like. It would be rich and famous. Rich and famous. Rich and famous. Rich and famous. Wow. This is, this, this is tremendous. Um, I, I, I want to thank the Academy, of course. And my wonderful wife, Nicole Hennig. And... Our fur boy, Maxwell Smart Cannington. I mean, he's also our executive producer. I just, I just couldn't have done it without any of them. <laughs> oh. oh, I just, what can I do for you all? Yeah, I'll give you some money. I need some money for you. I need some money for you. And 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 money for you. Get back to animals already. What? Weird animals? Did I hear someone say they want to hear more about weird animals? Aye aye! Ooh. Did I just say aye aye? Aye! Aye eyes are the world's largest nocturnal primate. They sport rodent like teeth that never stop growing, and they also have a distinctive spindly middle finger. The axolotl, a critically endangered species of salamander from Mexico City, retains some of its larval features, including gills, right through adulthood. How about the, how about the fact that flying lemurs don't fly? Also, they're not lemurs. Cute Speaking of flightless animals, the cassowary is known as a living dinosaur and is considered the world's most dangerous bird. You do not want to mess with one of these creatures. Did I mention that even if they can't fly, they can jump up to two meters into the air? Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure I did. <laughs> Dementor wasps inject a chemical potion into the heads of cockroaches, turning them into zombies, who then willingly walk into the Dementor wasp nest. Coming in, possibly, with the most punk name in the animal kingdom is the Sarcastic Fringe Head. Sarcastic Fringe Head. Punk. When threatened, these specific fish are able to open their mouths twice as large as their heads at rest. Uh, if you think you've seen this creature before, you're thinking of the Demogorgon from Stranger Things. Have you ever wanted to study the brains of fish but couldn't bear the thought of, her help, of hurting our helpless Piscine friends? Let me introduce you to the barrel-eyed fish living deep off the west coast of North America. Its head is transparent, giving the world a clear view of its brain. Pretty weird. Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we're going to welcome Neil deGrasse Tyson back to the show talking about artificial intelligence and the future of the human race. Be sure to join us starting on the 16th of September. You know, if you like subscribe to our show or are followed or whatever you do on that favorite social media network of yours, you'd see every episode, right? Right? Hey, just saying. Or, uh, to, or uh, head on over to the... Uh, to thecosmiccompanion.com and sign up for our newsletter. You'll see every episode. Do it! Do it! Clear skies.